Humans, are we accidents or are we made in the image of God? Atheists hold that man has no special purpose in the universe. Jerry Coyne, professor of emeritus of uh, evolutionary biology at the University of Chicago, states, We have no more intrinsic purpose than a squirrel or an armadillo. In 1903, Bertrand Russell makes much the same claim as Jerry Coyne in which he stated that man is but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms and that this supposed fact is yet so nearly certain that no philosophy that rejects them can hope to stand. Many other similar statements from leading atheists arguing for the inconsequentiality of man's existence can be gleaned from the writings of leading atheists. Darwin himself stated the differences between man and animals is one of degree, not of kind. But I hold it is this denigrating of man to be no more than an animal and even to be thought of as no more than the accidental collocations of atoms, and specifically the denial of the Judeo-Christian ethic that man is made in the image of God that has led to untold human suffering over the last 100 years. It should really be of no surprise that atheism and Darwinian evolution in particular and its denial of the sanctity of human life has had catastrophic effects on societies of man. Given the horror wrought by atheistic governments in the 20th century, this horror is fairly self-evident. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor, stated, I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Magdanik were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desk and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. The unmitigated horror visited upon man by state-sponsored atheism would be hard to exaggerate. Here is a brief overview of what happens when atheists or non-Christians take control of a government. And although many people may think that America has largely escaped the deadly effects that are wrought when a government is dominated by the atheistic worldview, that belief is not true. Specifically, the undermining of the sanctity of human life by atheism and by the Darwinian worldview in particular has led to abortion in America. Richard Weikart puts the undermining of the Judeo-Christian ethic of the sanctity of human life by Darwinian dogma as such. Only in the late 19th and especially earliest 20th century did significant debate erupt over issues relating to the sanctity of human life. It is no mere coincidence that these contentious issues emerged at the same time that Darwinism was gaining in influence. Darwinism played an important role in this debate for it altered many people's conceptions of the importance and value of human life. And indeed, abortion is now found to be the leading cause of death in America. In fact, abortion has now greatly exceeded the number of war casualties for all of America's wars. 
when factoring in grandchildren missing to abortion since Roe v. Wade in 1973, the number escalates even more dramatically. In his recent 2016 book, The Death of Humanity and the Case for Life, Richard Weikart, after demonstrating that the worst evils of the last 100 years came about when governments reject, rejected the intrinsic dignity and moral worth of human life, demonstrates by quoting atheists themselves that atheists cannot live consistently within their stated worldview. And as Nancy Piercy has also pointed out, many, many atheists themselves admit that they themselves cannot live consistently in their stated worldview, as if their lives had no real meaning and purpose. Even Richard Dawkins himself admitted that it would be intolerable for him to live as if his life had no real meaning and purpose. And what should be needless to say, if it is impossible for you to live as if your worldview were actually true, then your worldview cannot possibly reflect reality as it really is but your worldview must instead be based on a delusion. And although the inability of atheists themselves to live consistently within their own worldview is certainly a powerful argument that their worldview cannot possibly be true, I would like to add to the argument that atheism is a false view of reality. Specifically, I would like to point out that recently, many lines of evidence have, from science itself have undermined the atheist, atheistic belief that human life is an accident. First off, in what I consider an absolutely fascinating discovery, Four-dimensional space-time was created in the Big Bang and continues to expand equally in all places. That is to say, from a three-dimensional perspective, any particular three-dimensional spot in the universe is to be considered just as central in the universe as any other particular spot in the universe is to be considered central. This centrality found for any 3D place in the universe is because the universe is a four-dimensional expanding hypersphere, analogous to a three-dimensional surface of, on an expanding balloon. All points on the surface of the balloon are moving away from each other, and every, every point on the surface of the balloon can be considered central to the expansion, if that's where you live. In fact, as far as general relativity itself is concerned, centrality in the universe is left completely open for whomever is making a model of the universe to arbitrarily decide for themselves what is to be considered the center of the universe. Einstein himself conceded that either the Earth-centered model or the sun-centered model for the universe could be used with equal justification as far as general relativity itself was concerned. Moreover, both general and special relativity were derived by Einstein by giving an observer a privileged frame of reference in which to make measurements. And whereas general relativity and special relativity were derived by Einstein by giving an observer a privileged frame of reference in which to make measurements, on the other hand, in quantum mechanics, it is the measurement itself that gives the observer a privileged frame of reference in the universe. 
Here are a few more quotes along that line. Personally, I find it extremely interesting and strange that quantum mechanics tells us that instantaneous quantum wave collapse to its uncertain 3D state is centered on each individual conscious observer in the universe, whereas in four-dimensional space-time cosmology, in other words, within general relativity, it tells us that each three-dimensional point in the universe is central to the expansion of the universe. These findings of modern science are pretty much exactly what we would expect to see if this universe were indeed created and sustained from a higher dimension by an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, eternal being who knows everything that is happening in, everywhere in the universe at the same time. These findings by modern science certainly seem to go to the very heart of the age-old question asked of many parents by their children. How can God hear everybody's prayers at the same time? In other words, why should the expansion of the universe or the quantum wave collapse of the entire universe even care that you or I or anyone else should exist. Only theism, particularly Christian theism, offers a rational explanation as to why you or I or anyone else should have such undeserved significance in such a vast universe. To go further in regards to establishing centrality in the universe, in the following video, Neil Turok states, so we can go from 10 to the plus 25 to 10 to the minus 35. Now where are we? Well, the size of a living cell is about 10 to the minus 5, which is halfway between the two. In mathematical terms, we say it is in the geometric mean. We live in the middle between the largest scale of physics and the tiniest scale in physics. And in the following intergraph, interactive graph and video, it is pointed out that the smallest scale visible to the human eye, as well as the size of the human egg, is at 10 to the minus 4 meters, which just so happens to be, on that scale, directly in the exponential center of all possible sizes of our physical reality. This is very interesting for, as far as I can tell, the limits to human vision, as well as the size of the human egg, could have, theoretically, been at very different positions than direct, directly in the ge exponential middle or the geometric mean. Also of related interest, at the seven minute mark of the following video, Dr. Hugh Ross states that we live at the right time in cosmic history of the universe so as to be able to see the cosmic microwave background radiation, or the CMBR. On top of that, the light coming from the CMBR is also found to be fine-tuned to be discovered by intelligent life like human life. As well, another line of evidence that strongly suggests that man is not nearly as inconsequential as atheists imagine us to be comes from anomalies that are now found in the cosmic microwave background radiation, CMBR. Specifically, anomalies in the CMBR line up with the Earth and solar system. It's instead of lining up with other random, some other random location in the universe as would be expected under atheistic materialism. There are several papers backing that up. And at the 14 minute mark of the following video, Max Tegmark, an atheist, finally admits 
complaint 2013 that the CMBR anomalies do indeed line up with the Earth and solar system. Moreover, besides the Earth and solar system lining up with the anomalies of the CMBR, radio astro astronomy now reveals a surprising rotational coincidence for the Earth in relation to the quasar and radio galaxy distributions in the universe. Also of related interest, chemistry itself is also now found to be especially beneficial for intelligent life such as human life. Dr. Michael Dent has done research on this and has even extended it in his fire maker videos as shown here. Moreover, the Darwinian belief that humans are basically no different than animals and that we were we are not made in the image of God. In other words, the Darwinian belief that provides the supposed moral moral justification for abortion and for all the other many and for all the many other atrocities over the last 100 years is found to be false. First off, man is not nearly as similar to chimpanzees as Darwinists would have us believe. Here is a paper that lists many stark differences between humans and chimps. As well, although genetic similarity is often invoked by Darwinists to claim humans evolved from some chimp-like ancestor, Gene regulation has recently been found to be vastly different between even chimpanzees and humans. Here are several papers that clearly get that point across. Moreover, the fossil record for the supposed evolution of the humans from some chimp-like ancestor is far more discontinuous than people have been led to believe by Darwinists. Here are several references backing up that claim. And although man is not nearly as similar to apes as many people have been falsely led to believe by Darwinists, one, the one thing that many leading Darwinists themselves agree on that separates man most dramatically from all animals, and from apes in particular, is our ability to understand and create information. Ian Tattersall and Jeffrey Swartz put that dramatic separation of humans from animals like this. Human beings alone, it seems, mentally dissect the world into a multitude of discrete symbols and combine and recombine those symbols in their minds to produce hypotheses and alternative possibilities. When exactly Homo sapiens acquired this unusual ability is the subject of debate. Furthermore, in 2014, a group of leading experts in this area of language research authored another paper in which they confess that we have essentially no explanation of how and why our linguistic computations and representations evolved. Best-selling author Tom Wolfe was so taken aback by this Honest confession by leading Darwinists that he wrote a book on the subject. Wolf's argument in his book, The Kingdom of Speech, boils down to this. Speech is 95% plus of what lifts man above animals. Physically, man is a sad case. In hand to paw, hand to claw, or hand to incisor combat, any animal his size would have him for lunch. Yet, 
Man owns and controls them all. Every animal that exists thanks to his superpower, speech. Moreover, that humans should master the planet due to his unique ability to communicate is completely contrary to the survival of the fittest thinking that undergirds Darwinian thought. That is to say, although humans are fairly defenseless creatures in the wild compared to other creatures such as lions, bears, sharks, etc., nonetheless humans have, completely comp contrary to Darwinian survival of the fittest thinking, managed to somehow become masters of the planet, not by brute force, but simply by our unique ability to communication, to communicate information, and, more specifically, to infuse information into material substrates in order to create intelligently designed objects that are extremely useful for our defense, for our basic survival skills in procuring food, food or instruments that are useful for uh, furtherance of our knowledge and also inventing things for our entertainment and although this the uh, top-down infusion of information into material substrates that allowed humans to become masters of the planet was rather crude to begin with, such as spears, arrows, plows, etc. This top-down infusion of information into material substrates has become much more impressive over the last half a century or so. Specifically, the top-down infusion of mathematical and or logical information into material substrates lies at the very basis of many, if not all, of man's most stunning, almost miraculous technological advances in recent decades. Here are a couple of articles which clearly get this point across. What is more interesting still about the fact that humans have a unique ability to understand and create information and have come to dominate the world through the top-down infusion of information into material substrates is the fact that due to advances in science, both the universe and life itself are now found to be information theoretic in their foundational basis. Renowned Physicist John Wheeler stated, in short, all matter and all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. In the following article, Anton Zeilinger, a leading expert in quantum mechanics, stated, it may very well be said that information is the irreducible kernel from which everything else flows. And in the following video at the 48 minute mark, Zollinger states it's operationally impossible to separate reality and information. And he goes on to note at the 50 minute mark the significance of uh, John 1 1 in the beginning was the word. In other words, he states, the, ba the Bible basically predicted that the universe was information theoretic in its foundational basis all along, long before quantum mechanics ever came along. And Professor Bidraw, who is professor of physics at the University of Oxford, also recognized a uh, leader in the field of quantum mechanics stated it is the processing of information that lies at the root of all physical, biological, economic, and social phenomena. Moreover, besides information being foundational, foundational to physical reality, information is also now found to be foundational 
to biological life. Here are a few videos and an article that clearly gets this point across. Of supplemental it's the amount of information that is infused into a simple bacterial cell is, when looking at it from a thermodynamic perspective, found to be much more than what is just encoded on the DNA. It is hard to imagine a more convincing proof that we are made in the image of God than finding that both the universe and life itself were information theoretic in their foundational basis, and that we, of all the creatures on earth, uniquely possess an ability to understand and create, understand and create information, and have even come to master the planet mastered the planet not by brute force but, but precisely because of our ability to infuse information into material substrates. I guess a more convincing evidence that we are made in the image of God could be if God himself became a man, defeated death on a cross, and then rose from the dead to prove that he was God. But who has ever heard of such overwhelming evidence as that?